what we were doing at the end of the hour last time. Uh, we're uh, talking about magnetic resonance uh, experiments. Uh, these involve typically a, a uniform magnetic field, which are called B0, pointing in some direction B0 hat. This is constant in time and in space. It's assumed to be, in, in a certain sense, a large field. Then we have a time-dependent field, which we call B1, which is placed in an orthogonal direction. And it has its periodic in time, with the periodic with the frequency, which is omega-1, is the uh, frequency of the, uh, of the small field. Uh, the small field B1 is regarded as perturbation. That's how it's, that's how it's done in, in uh, uh, that's how it's applied in, in practice. Uh, we're denoting by the frequency of precession in the background field. We're calling that the uh, excuse me, omega zero, which is gamma times B zero. Gamma is the quantity minus G times the charge divided by two mc. It has a minus sign in it. Here I'm assuming the charge. For simplicity, we'll assume here the charge is negative or else the G factor is negative, so the gamma is positive. You'll have to go through this again, <coughs> uh, this business again, and rethink it in the case of a, uh, uh, of the case in which uh, gamma has the opposite sign. Uh, in any case, uh, notice the difference in the notation because omega zero is the frequency of precession in the background field B zero, whereas omega one is the frequency of the time dependence of B one, and is therefore independent of the magnitude of B one. Now the interesting case, well actually we're going to solve this system in all generality for a certain certain uh, time dependence of B1. But the interesting case from an experimental standpoint is one in which the magnitude of B1 is much smaller than B0, so that it plays the role of a small perturbation. And moreover, one in which the frequency of the perturbation is comparable to the precession frequency in the background field. This is a resonance condition, and what it means is, is that over time, even though the perturbation is small, its effects can build up to have a large effect. And in particular, as we'll see, it induces spin flips of the spins, which are processing in the background field. So this is the basic setup. And in the Schrodinger equation, which I wrote down at the end of the hour last time, it's just simply this right here, with the total magnetic field B0 plus B1. Uh, notice the Hamiltonian now has an explicit time dependence, because B1 is time dependent. Uh, Hamiltonians with explicit time dependence are usually hard to solve. You, you need to solve a time dependent Schrodinger equation, which is what this is. Uh, but this is, turns out, uh, it, for the particular time dependence we'll consider, this is a case where an exact solution can be given. Now, in particular, the time dependence for B1 that we're going to consider is one in which the B1 vector is rotating on a counterclockwise direction in a plane, in a plane perpendicular to B0. So, Maybe just to rewrite it a little bit, if I call this B1 zero at the initial time, and then here's a B1 at a later time, at a time t like this, and the angle here is the angle is, is this angle here is uh, omega one times t. So just picture that it's turning around and around in a perpendicular plane. Let's take this as a as an example of a, of a time dependence at frequency omega one. All right. If we do this, then this vector B1, which appears here, can be written in terms of uh, the rotation matrix, a rotation matrix about the axis B0 by an angle which is omega 1t. So let's write this this way as R of B0 hat uh, omega 1t applied to the initial conditions for the B1 vector, which I'll call just B10. That's a constant vector that you see here. And in fact, this rotation matrix appears often enough to allow me to make an abbreviation for it. R1 of t is defined to be the rotation matrix about the axis B0 with the frequency of omega 1 t. <coughs> OK, so that's just a way of rewriting this time dependence. Now, the way we solve the Schrodinger equation is that, in effect, we go over to a rotating frame. The rotating frame is going to be one that's rotating in exactly the same way that B1 is rotating in a counterclockwise direction around the axis B0. Because the idea is that if we do this, then the time dependence of B1 is canceled out. This is the whole point, is to get rid of the time, time dependence in the Hamiltonian. Uh, because in the rotating frame, the B1 is in a constant vector. Uh, so here's what we'll do, is we'll take our state vector psi of t, and we'll write it as a unitary rotation operator with the same axis, B0 hat, and the same angle, omega 1 of t, as our rotation multiply it onto a new ket vector we'll call phi of t. So that in effect phi of t becomes the uh, ket vector for the system in the rotating frame. And then we just take this, we just take this, uh, this transformation and substitute it into the Schrodinger equation. 
this U that appears here is the same axis and angle as this R1 that I defined. So the same writing, let me just call this also U1 of T is, this, is the U with the same axis and angle of angle 1 of T. These are related by having the same axis and angle with classical and quantum rotations here. So now we just need to do the algebra of substituting this, uh, this transformation into the original Schrodinger equation. And that's just a matter of differentiating it. So IH bar VDT acting on psi is first of all IH bar VDT acting on U. This is, this is the same as U1. Uh, but this U1 here, if we write it out in, in exponential form, is E to the minus I omega 1 T and E0 hat dotted into the spin. Because these are spin rotations. This is just the exponential form of the rotation operator. And so differentiating with respect, this is over H bar. And so differentiating with respect to T, we can just bring down the exponent minus T. And uh, so the differenti differentiating this U here, oh, and by the way, we can bring down the exponent either to the right or to the left of the operator. It won't matter because it can use for the, for the exponential. So allow me to write this this way as this is the same thing as U1 of T phi to phi of T. So I'm taking the derivative of u1, let me write it this way, it's u1 times, uh, it's going to be omega 1, v0 hat, uh, in the spin s, times phi, that's just the first term. The ih bar here canceled the minus i over h bar there, the t disappeared in differentiation, and omega 1 v0 dotted in the s is what's left over. And then in addition, we need to differentiate phi, so we've got the operator u1, and then this is multiplied by ih bar, uh, DDT applied to phi itself, like this. Okay? So this is differentiating the left hand side. Now, we'll plug this into the Schrodinger equation for psi over the right hand side, and therefore that's equal to our factor gamma. Gamma, by the way, is the constant that converts magnetic field strings into frequencies, as you see here. They're proportional to one another, and gamma is just a proportionality factor. Anyway, gamma is then multiplied times V0 plus V1, which I'm going to now write as R1 times V10, which is R1 of T, it really depends on time, times V10, dotted into the spin S, multiplied times psi, but psi is the same thing as U1 times phi, so I'll put U1 phi like this, okay? Now what we're going to be interested in solving for is the time dependence of the new cat phi, so we'll do this, the obvious thing to do is to multiply both sides of this equation from the left-hand side by U1 inverse, which is, of course, the same thing as U1 dagger. So let's apply, multiply U1 dagger to this expression above and this expression below, which are equal to each other. And if we do, on the above, we get omega 1 times V0 hat dotted into spin S, multiplying phi. Then we get plus IH bar, E phi E T, for the second term up here. Now multiplying U1 dagger on the line below, let's notice that gamma is a constant, so you can just pull U1 right through it. Uh, the vectors B0 and B10 are vectors, but they're just vectors of numbers. They don't, they don't depend, they're not otherwise, they're multiplicative operator, operators, but otherwise they're not operators. So you can just pull the U1 right through them too. And likewise, the R1 of T is just a matrix of numbers. So the net effect is the U1 dagger can be pulled through all this stuff and just bring it next to the S, which really is a genuine non-trivial operator acting on the, on the spinner, on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, uh, yeah, on the spinner phi. So the result is, is that this becomes equal to the right-hand side is gamma, copying these vectors, it's V0 plus R1 times V10. And then this is dotted into, you can see we've got U1 dagger SU1. U1 dagger SU1, like this, which is then multiplied on the phi. This is what we get. And so now you've got a conjugation of the spin operator by a rotation operator. Well, this conjugation is exactly what the adjoint formula is for. And I'll remind you that in general, in general terms, we work this out. Uh, this is the uh, this is the adjoint formula. This is conjugating. A, this is in general notation here, where J is any angular momentum for a system, and U is the corresponding 
rotation operator, but we have conjugate, it's equivalent to rotating the angular momentum by the corresponding classical rotation. With J replaced by spin S, uh, that's just what we have here, it's U1. So the result of this is that this conjugated spin operator here is the same thing as R1 as a matrix just multiplying the spin. With R better, R1 better. Okay? Like that. That's equal to that. All right. Now then, in the right-hand side, we have a dot product of two vectors, a magnetic field vector and a rotated spin vector. Here we can use a useful identity, which uh, I guess I'll put back here because it's, it's a kind of a little digression. A uh, useful identity is this. If you have two vectors, x and y, and there's a dot product except the y, let's say, is rotated by some rotation, you can transfer the rotation over to the other side of the dot product if you replace it by its inverse. So this is R1 applied to Y dotted into X. Now the reason for this identity is, is that the dot product is invariant under rotations. And so if you take the two sides of the dot product and multiply both of them by the same rotation, it won't change the dot product. So allow me to multiply both sides of this, of this dot product by R inverse, which moves the R inverse. Oops, this should be, I did this wrong. This is X and Y. X and Y don't change. All right, let's say it again. Uh, multiply both sides of this dot product by R inverse. You get the R inverse applied to the X, and it cancels the R and the Y, so you get the identity. <coughs> All right. In any case, that's just what we need to do here, because we have this dot product. There's a rotation applied to S. I'm going to move this rotation over to the other side of the dot product, and then I have to replace it by a minus, yeah, or R, uh, minus 1 R1 inverse. So this is gamma times R1 inverse multiplying the vector, which is B0 plus R1 times B10. That creates one new vector, which I'll put in square brackets, dotted into the spin S, then multiply by the phi. Okay? Now, R1 is a rotation about the z-axis, or B0 axis, excuse me. Use the word, it's usually the z-direction. Uh, and that's just what B0 is here. So the R1 or R1 inverse doesn't do anything to B0 when I bring this inside the parentheses. On the other, one, on the other hand, for B10, the R1 inverse cancels the R1. And that's good because that's where all the time dependence lies in the original Hamiltonian. And so this thing becomes the same thing as gamma times B0 plus simply B10 dotted in spin S multiplying phi, and to repeat the left hand side, left hand side, left hand side is what you see up here. Okay. Now, uh, let me bring the gamma inside. Gamma times B0 is, that I say it here, times its magnitude is the frequency of omega zero. So this, this can be written this way, bringing the gamma inside is omega zero times B0 hat plus gamma times B10 dotted in the spin S multiplied phi, like that. And now, I'm going to bring this omega 1 term, which is multiplied by B0 dotted in the S. Notice you've got omega 0 times B0 dotted in the S for this first term. So I bring this over, and it'll subtract frequencies. And the result is going to be a, a simplified Schrodinger equation for uh, the new variable uh, phi. And it looks like this. It's IH bar DDT applied to phi. It's equal to, uh, I'll use a square brackets here, and then it's omega 0 minus omega 1 applied to B0 half uh, plus gamma times B10 dotted into the spin S multiplied by phi. <coughs> Now, this is great progress because we've eliminated the time dependence of the Hamiltonian, in effect, by going to this rotating frame. What you see here is the initial conditions for the uh, perpendicular vector, but it's no time dependence anymore. And in fact, this is of the same form of the simpler problem that we solved in the last lecture, in which you just got a uniform magnetic field. In that case, you know that the spin just precesses around the direction of the magnetic field. It's a rotation operator uh, whose, whose axis is the magnetic field and whose angle is gamma times the magnetic field strength times time. So its frequency is gamma times the field strength. All right, so this is what we've got here. 
Uh, so we can write this, and let's write this thing in the square brackets in various ways. This can be written as, let's call it gamma times an effective magnetic field. And we can write that as gamma times the magnitude of the effective magnetic field times the unit vector of the effective magnetic field. And if we do this, then the solution becomes immediate. And this is if phi is a function of time, is the rotation operator. Oh, let me do one more thing here. Let's take gamma times B effective. Let's give this a name. This is the frequency. We'll call it a capital gamma here. This frequency is uh, given a name. By the way, it's called the Robbie flopping frequency. The Robbie flopping frequency. Uh, I suppose I could call it omega effective. This really means the same thing. And so the solution then is, is that phi is a function of time is equal to a rotation operator with an axis which is b hat effective, an angle which is capital omega t, the rod frequency times time, multiplying by phi of zero. All right. Now, uh, that's just from the uniform field solution. Now, um, in a minute, I'll combine this with the uh, transformation up at the top of the board here. I don't know if your video can get up that high. Connecting the psi and the, and the phi, this is the transformation that is supposed to go to the rotating frame. But before I do that, allow me to interpret this uh, effective magnetic field to the effective here, which is represented in various ways here. Uh, let's draw a picture here. Here's the original magnetic field, which we think of as being strong. B0 times B0 hat. And here is the perpendicular field, B10, let's say at the initial time like this, which is supposed to be much smaller. Now, this thing that occurs in the square brackets, first of all, omega 0 times B0 hat, that's the first term. This is just another way of, of writing uh, gamma times magnitude B0 times B0 hat, which is just the same thing as gamma times the magnitude of B0. And um, so the, uh, this first term here, uh, well, if I want to plot magnetic fields, let me factor out a factor of gamma and just take it out. And uh, so what we're doing is we're subtracting from B0, we're subtracting uh, another field, which is omega 1 times B0 divided by gamma. So let's, let's draw the subtracted field like this. So this is the field which is B0 minus omega 1 over gamma times B0 hat. That's effectively the first term here. And so the vector sum of these two vectors is the effective magnetic field, which is going to be plotted line like this. This is B, B effective. And then the vector, and stretch it out like this. There's a unit vector B effective in that direction. OK. Now, here's the physics of what's happening. It has to do with Coriolis Coriola forces. Uh, you know, if you go into a rotating frame, there are pure, usually called fictitious forces. Uh, and the, uh, these are Coriolis forces. And they go like proportional to the velocity crossed into the angular, angular velocity, where the velocity is the velocity of the particle is seen in the rotating frame. And the angular velocity is the angular velocity of the rotation. So these are the Coriolis forces. But these have the same functional form as a force uh, 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 on a V cross B force on a charged particle in the magnetic field. Here we're thinking of a uniform angular velocity in a uniform magnetic field. So the result is that if you go in the, into a rotating frame in which the axis of rotation is the same as that of the magnetic field, you can get velocity-dependent forces that either add or subtract one another. In effect, you, you can compensate for the effect of the magnetic field by means of Coriolis forces. And this is what's happening here, is that this term, which is minus 1 times B0 hat over gamma, this is a, giving this is the effective magnetic field, which is due to the Coriolis force with a minus sign. And it's canceling out the, the, the magnetic field of the or, original background field. Now, the way I drew it, it, can, it actually canceled out most of it. It's, it's a large, largely canceled all of it. Um, if you put it in this form here, where you see that it's omega 0 minus omega 1 times B0, you see that this near cancellation occurs when the frequency of the perturbation becomes comparable to the frequency, precession frequency in the background field. In other words, it's a resonance condition. If you go to exact resonance in which you're, you're these are usually microwaves, by the way, this, this frequency omega 1, 
the microwave frequency omega-1 becomes exactly equal to the precession frequency, then you've got an exact cancellation, and this vector just drops to zero, and there's nothing left but the V10 in the rotating frame. More generally, there remains a component along here. So I think I mentioned somewhere that the experimentally interesting case is where omega-1 is close to omega-0, and that means that most of this field has been canceled. That's the way I drew it here. All right. The perpendicular field remains, but it's now time independent because you're in the rotating frame and you're rotating with, with the direction of that field. So this is the, uh, this is the physics of this transformation, and uh, it good, also gives you the, the meaning of this effective magnetic field. So here's what it is, and this is this frequency capital omega. Now the frequency capital omega can be expressed in terms of these other frequencies here, and it's just, just doing the trigonometry. And what you get is for the this capital omega, which is our, our Robby flopping frequency, it's omega zero minus omega one quantity squared plus gamma squared times V one zero squared. <coughs> and again, if you're near resonance, the first term is small. This gamma V one zero would be the precession frequency if the V one zero is the only field you had. It's a much lower frequency than the background frequency. But the result is, is that near resonance, omega is comparable, so it's a much lower frequency than the background frequency. Okay, so in any case, this gives our solution in the rotating frame. Now to get the solution back in the original frame, all we have to do is to apply this transformation to the top of the board, and this then gives us that psi of t is equal to our u1, which is u of v0 hat times omega 1t, times this Robby precession, which is along the axis of the effective, and then capital omega t, applied to the initial conditions, which is psi of 0. You see, from the top of the board, the, at t equals 0, psi and phi are the same thing, because the u operator is identity. So I just replace this phi of 0 here by psi of 0 over here. And this then is the solution. So this is an explicit solution then for this problem in this particular time-dependent magnetic field. Now it's straightforward to take this solution to the Schrodinger equation and convert it into a solution for the expectation value of spin. And if you do this, what you get is, this is exactly like what we did for the uniform field. And again, you need to use the adjoint formula to derive it. But the time dependence of the expectation value of spin is the is, is, is given by the, uh, the initial spin, time t equals zero, multiplied by rotation matrices. These are now classical rotations with the same axes and angles that appear in the quantum solution. Like this. And so to draw a picture here, I take my original background field V0, like this, and Let's say we've got a, uh, let's see how shall we do this. Let's say we've got a, a, a B effective that sticks out like this. So this is our, this is our B effective here in this direction. And let's say you've got an initial spin, which doesn't have to be pointing in any particular direction. So here's the S, S, S at the time zero, like this. Then the effect of this motion is to, first of all, rotate the initial spin about the axis B effective at the flopping frequency like this. So you're going around like this at frequency capital omega t. However, at the same time, the axis of the of this so this, this so then the spin sweeps out a cone about this direction to be effective. But at the same time we then apply on top of that this rotation about the direction V0 at the frequency of omega 1. And what that does is take this whole cone and makes it rotate properly like this around around the, the axis P0 at the frequency of omega 1. Under the uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, 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 case, which I mentioned up here, where V1 is much smaller than V0, and omega 1 is approximately the same as omega 0, it means you have a high frequency precession around the background field, but at the same time, you've got a much slower frequency motion along this cone up and down like this. And so this means that if you take the direction of the spin on the sphere, you the north and south pole here, you get, you, get to, you get a band like this. There's an upper and a lower limit, which is determined by the, uh, by the size of the smaller cone. And the, the, uh, the spin is basically precessing rapidly around the z direction, but it's only going small, small, slower oscillations up and down. 
It does this, it goes up and then it goes down like this and then it goes back up again. It oscillates back and forth. And if you set this up right, where you exactly cancel, like where you exactly have resonance, then the V effective is in the XY plane. And what happens is that this band in the center in the equator, so you're going up and down between plus and minus the same Z values. In particular, if the spin started out, at average value of spin started out being exactly in the Z direction, then what's going to happen is it will spiral all the way down to the south pole and then spiral back again, up and down, at the, uh, at the uh, Robbie floppy frequency. So that's the uh, solution. Okay. Well, this is the basic mathematics of, uh, of, uh, of magnetic resonance uh, uh, type experiments. And let me just say some things about the, uh, now about the many, many applications that these are put to. Um, first of all, uh, in nuclear physics, uh, this can be used to measure magnetic moments of uh, nuclear particles. It's one of the first applications used. because much higher precision than you can get with the old, old fashioned stern gerlach type apparatus. Um, the, uh, another thing you can do is, uh, because you see the, the point is, is that experimentally you control the frequency omega-1 by tuning your RF oscillator until you get a resonance. And frequencies can be measured with rather, rather high precision. This is much better than a Stern Gerlach where you have to measure the positions of those blobs on the, on the screen where the spots hit, you know. Um, anyway, uh, uh, anyway uh, so that's one application. Another application is that the uh, energy levels of the states SMS of a nucleus in a magnetic field, in the background magnetic field, um, they in general don't depend entirely on the magnetic moment. Uh, that's all we've been taking into account in this discussion. But the nucleus is a charge, is a charge in current distribution, and in general it has higher multipole moments such as an electric quadrupole moment turns out to be important. And that actually affects the energy levels of these, of these states in, in, the, in a given magnetic field. And so one can, one can make measurements of these higher order moments. The measurement of the uh, non-zero electric quadrupole moment of the deuteron was the first great success of this type of experiment and gave a good deal of insight into the structure of the deuteron. I may say more about that later in the course. Uh, so this is a use of nuclear physics. Uh, this uh, technique is also used in chemistry and condensed matter physics. The reason is this, is that this background field, which you apply here from some external coils, is not necessarily exactly the same <coughs> magnetic field as seen by the nucleus. And the reason is, is that the nucleus is in an environment of an electron cloud, it's in some atom somewhere, a molecule, and that electron cloud partially shields or modifies the external magnetic field. The effect isn't very much. I think the numbers are something like one part in 10 to the sixth. But uh, nevertheless, the result is that, for example, if you're looking at a hydrogen atom or a proton or something, the, um, the exact magnetic field at the, at the location of the proton depends on the chemical nature of the molecule that, that the hydrogen atom finds itself in. And so this gives a good deal of information that can be compared to theory and so on for um, understanding electronic structure in, in, uh, in, uh, in chemistry and condensed matter physics. So that's another application. This is something that's called a chemical shift. There's a chemical shift that makes the name of the use for this with frequency shift um, in, uh, because of this effect. Um, related to this is, uh, well, there's also, I guess you know, there's magnetic resonance imaging, so-called, which is medical, medical imaging. Um, there they measure, amongst other things, the density of protons in a biological sample, which usually is a person. And um, they, uh, uh, they are using, uh, actually, magnet, background magnetic field as a spatial gradient. So it's stronger at one end at your toes than it is at your, your head, or vice versa. And what this does is it means the resonance frequency, the omega zero here, is a function of position. So by changing the changing the microwave frequency they're looking at, they can get different slices through the, through the body. Uh, there's quite a bit more to the MRI imaging than this, as a matter of fact. In fact, the chemical shifts play a role as well and have to do with how they can tell differences between different types of tissue. It has to do with this same chemical shift I just mentioned. And then finally, another application is in atomic clocks. Uh, there are various designs for atomic clocks, but the most accurate ones use uh, cesium atoms. And they use a... Um, a transition, a spin transition in cesium. So the first thing you do is polarize the cesium. This can be done with, with a Stern-Gerlach apparatus. 
then you run it through a uh, magnetic resonance uh, type apparatus with the attempt of making a single spin flip from one side up to down. And then you run it through another uh, steering gear lock apparatus, which if you really flip them all down, you just get one down beam and no up beam on the, on the output. Well, if your frequency of your R, if your RF frequency starts to drift a little bit, then you're going to start to get some you start to start to get some pump, uh, some up beam as well, some up spin. And so what you do is you have a feedback mechanism that, that looks at which spin is coming out through the second steering gear lock apparatus, and you feed it back in to lock the frequency so that you stay on a single output beam. And what that does is it gives you a uh, this uh, this RF generator here is now is now in lockstep with the with the uh, frequency of spin transitions, and uh, gives a very uh, accurate uh, plot in that way. And you put counters on it to count the count the number of oscillations and divide it up to get seconds and so on. This is the these atomic plots I might mention are the basis of the GPS system. They put these things in, in a geosynchronous orbit and they send out timing signals uh, down to the Earth, which are, if you can find like, between several of them, you can find out where you are on the surface of the Earth. They're so accurate that it's necessary to correct for both special and general relativity and the uh, motion of the satellite in order to get the, uh, uh, in order to get the uh, desired accuracy of position on, on the ground. Okay, uh, and for lack of time, I won't tell you about spin echoes, but that's quite important. It's a technique developed by Erwin Hahn, who's now a retired professor in the department. All right, so uh, that's all for magnetic resonance. And um, I'd now like to uh, go on to the new subject, which is that of orbital <coughs> angular momentum. This is a uh, in general, uh, continuing <coughs> with the general topic of uh, rotations and angular momentum theory and pausing for applications. So I want to turn now to the topic of orbital angular momentum. So for this purpose, let's consider a single particle without spin moving in three-dimensional space. So the wave function is, of course, psi of x, y, and z. Uh, and allow me to write this as psi of r vector, where r is just the position vector where the electron wave function lives. <coughs> Now let me remind you that way back when we were doing translation operators, uh, in three dimensions, the translation operators parameterized by displacement A, and we found that this acts on the position eigenket and moves it over to a new place, which is just a displaced position. This makes physical sense because the ket R, the position ket, represents the result uh, after one has made a measurement and found the particle to lie in some small region around this position vector R. Then if you want to apply a translation operator, and this is in an active sense, it's logical the new space should be localized around the translated position, exactly as this, this equation indicates. This equation implies that the translation operator acts on wave functions in the following way, that the translated wave function evaluated at position r is equal to the original wave function evaluated at the inverse translated position. This is something we went through earlier with translation operators. Well, now what I'd like to do is to extend this to the case of rotations. So let's let R be a proper rotation that belongs to SO3. And we want, to, we want to figure out what is the rotation operator that corresponds to it, U of R. Well, the logical thing to do on the pattern of the translation operators is to say that U of R acts on a position eigenket at a position vector lowercase r and just moves it over to the rotated position the obvious thing to say from an active standpoint of rotations. And if you do this, you'll find the corresponding wave function. You act on the wave function like this, and evaluate it at a position r. But this is the original wave function evaluated at the inverse rotated position. This is just exactly in a pattern of what happened with translations. Nevertheless, this minus one that occurs here is, can be uh, confusing. It's hard to remember. So let me show you a picture to make it clear that you really need to have this here. Let's draw it in a plane here. So let's say we've got the xy plane. And let's say there's some wave function here, which is like a wave packet like this. And let's call this the old wave function, old wave function psi. And let me choose a point on this. It doesn't have to be at the center. Maybe it's on the tail of the wave function like this. And I'll call this point r0, like that. <coughs> Now, I want to apply rotation in an active sense. That means this wave packet's going to get moved over to a new place. 
let's draw it over here. Here's the new wave pattern. Let's call the new wave function psi prime. Now let me take an equivalent point on this new wave packet on the same tail and call this, and draw this new vector over here. Well, the new vector should be the rotated version of the old vector. That's just what we mean by applying a rotation. So this psi prime is the same, it's going to be this u of r acting on psi zero. Let's see, if the skew, the skew. Psi prime, the new ro or rotated wave function is our u of r rotational operator acting on the old wave function, which we call the psi like this. Well, from this pixel, this is what r does, it rotates, it rotates the old and the new. Well, from this picture, the value of the new wave function at this rotated point is the same as the value of the old wave function at the unrotated point. In other words, psi prime, evaluated at r times r0, is equal to the original psi, evaluated at position r0, the original position like this. However, this r0, position r0, which occurs here, is just a dummy variable. So let's do this. Let's, let's let r0 be equal to rotation operator r times another position r. It, uh, excuse me, uh, make this inverse, like this. And if we do this, then we get psi prime at position r is equal to the original psi at the inverse rotated position. And this is just the rule, repeating the rule I had over here, but just showing you that it follows from a picture, that's all. Okay, so this is the, this is the uh, geometrical meaning of this, of this uh, uh, effectively a definition of rotation operators now. So by doing this, we have the most logical definition of rotation operators on such wave, on spinless wave functions in three dimensions. So we know what the rotation operators are. One thing to notice right away is that these, uh, is that the representation is single value. That is to say, for a given classical rotation, there is only one rotation operator, not two, as we found in the case of spin one half particles. And what that means right away is, is, that, is that the angular momentum values, which are contained in this, in this rotation action, can only be integers. As we saw earlier, the half integer angular uh, momenta are always double value representations of classical rotations. By the way, we change notation when we're talking, we're talking about orbital angular momentum. The general notation of J and quantum number J, which we apply for any kind of angular momentum, are now going to be replaced by an L and L. This is a standard uh, convention in the physics literature anyway for the uh, orbital angular momentum that is quantum number. In any case, we can see now that quantum number L can only take on integer values, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, what about angular momentum? We've defined in this course angular momentum as the generator of rotations. So, um, if we call the angular momentum L, it means that our rotation operator U of R, which we just defined, must be uh, must be possible to write. Let's suppose, let's suppose I take it in axis angle form. Let's take it U as U of n hat comma theta. This must be equal to e to the minus i over h bar times theta times n hat dotted in L. That's effectively the definition of the angular momentum operator. And if the angle is small, this becomes 1 minus i over h bar theta times n hat dotted into L, just expanding out to the first term of the Taylor series when theta is small. <coughs> All right. <coughs> now, uh, let's use, it's in the box right here, let's use this definition of u up there. It expresses u in terms of the classical rotation. Let's make the angle small and plug it in to that expression of above. In order to do that, I'll need something for r inverse. So if we take r, the same angle and, 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 and axis, this is the same thing as e to the theta n hat dotted into script j. I'll remind you that's from our study of classical rotations. And if I make an inverse on it, it's the same as changing the sign on theta, so I get a minus sign there. And expanding that out to first order, we have the identity minus theta times n hat dotted into these script J matrices, which are this vector of three by three matrices. And both of these, both of these equations apply when theta is much less than one. Now, let's plug it into our formula for rotated wave function. So uh, the U of R acting on psi is going to be one minus pi over h bar theta times n hat dotted into angular momentum L. 
is at the side of the rotated wave function, which we evaluate in the position R vector. And on the right hand side, this is going to be psi evaluated at the inverse rotated position, which is this matrix here, I minus theta times n hat dotted in the script J, multiplying the position vector R, like so. Uh, let's expand the right hand side first. This is the same thing as psi evaluated at position vector R minus theta n hat dotted in the J multiplying R. But I'll remind you that n hat dotted in the J acting on a vector is an alternative notation for the cross product. So this is the same thing as n hat cross R. So this is psi evaluated at position R minus theta times n hat cross R. And since theta is small, we expand this out, we get psi of R minus theta times n hat cross <coughs> R dotted into the gradient of psi. Meanwhile, on the left hand side, the identity operator 1 just gives us psi of R. And the correction term is going to be is a, the numerical factor is minus i over h bar theta. And there's the operator n hat dotted into L. And this acts on psi. And so this thing over here has to equal to that thing over there. The leading term is psi of R, as you might expect. The next term has a common factor of, of theta in both cases. So I'll drop the theta. There's, there's minus signs. I can cancel them too. I'll bring the i over h bar over to the other side. And if we do, we obtain this. Is it n hat dotted into L acting on psi is equal to uh, minus i h bar times n hat cross r dotted into gradient psi. Well, allow me to rearrange this whole product so that it becomes n hat dotted into r cross gradient psi. So it's minus i over h bar n hat dotted into r cross gradient psi. Now the n hat is an arbitrary unit vector, so we can drop that to both sides, and we get L acting on the side, the orbital angular momentum <coughs> is equal to minus i h bar times r cross gradient psi. However, minus i h bar times the gradient is the momentum, and so this is the same thing as r cross p acting on the side. And the result of this is that the, the, the appearance of the orbital angle of momentum L is equal to R cross P. Okay. The usual way, if this is the only result, of course, the usual way of deriving this in, in our argument for in, in, uh, in your introductory courses is to say that that's the def L R cross P is the definition of angular momentum in classical mechanics, and we'll just borrow it in quantum mechanics and call it the angular momentum there. But you see here, this is being derived as a generator of rotations, which are defined in the most obvious way for how rotations can be defined on wave functions. And it gives the same answer. There's something else that comes out, too. We showed quite generally that if you had a representation of rotations, that the generators satisfy the angular momentum commutation relations. And so that has to apply to this analysis as well. And so uh, if you have confidence that, that everything you've done so far is correct, then you must have the standard angular momentum commutation relations for orbital angular momentum. Now, of course, you can check that by using the Heisenberg form commutation relations for position and momentum and, re and recalculate this as so a check to see that you're doing things right. And it has to be right. Of course, it comes out, comes out correctly. These are the commutation relations. Is it I'm sorry, I made a Poisson bracket. I meant to make, make a commutator. I've been doing too many Poisson brackets lately. All right. Now, so the result of this is that we have now uh, both rotation operators and their generators, which is the angular momentum for spinless particles moving in three dimensions. The next thing we'd like to do in pursuing um, angular momentum theory is to set up the standard angular momentum basis. I'll remind you that in the general notation we used previously, we call this gamma JM. 
this is a simultaneous eigenbase system of the operators j squared and jz. And in case their simultaneous eigenstates are degenerate, we have to introduce an additional n index to resolve the degeneracies. We talked about this before. Well, in order to find the standard angular momentum basis in the present case, we would like to find the simultaneous eigens, eigenvectors, or eigenfunctions in this case, of the operators L squared and LC. So, and they might be degenerate. We'll see whether they are or not. Let's call these things psi LM of position vector R. So we want L squared acting on this is equal to L times L plus 1, psi LM of R. And we want LZ acting on this, psi LM of R is equal to M times psi LM of R. And I'm going to, uh, I think for the rest of the lecture today, I'll set H bar equals to 1 because it saves some writing. But these are, these are the equations we want to solve to find these simultaneous eigenfunctions of, of uh, L squared and LC. Now, the way we do this is we, um, we uh, take these operators, uh, the angular momentum operators L, which is R cross P, there's really three operators, the three components of angular momentum, and uh, write them out as differential operators, which I've summarized for you here on this board. Uh, here they are. Here they are written out as R cross P with momentum operators written out as derivatives. Uh, then what we do is we take these three differential operators and we transform them over to spherical coordinates. This involves the chain rule. Uh, you don't, don't bother to copy this down because this, this is, is kind of complicated and it's in the notes. But uh, if you do this, then you get, uh, you get differential operators in R theta and phi. So it's just a coordinate transformation from x, y, z over to R theta and phi as far as transforming these operators. And this is what you obtain for the three components of angular momentum. And then from that, you can construct the L plus and minus, which is the same thing as Lx plus and minus Ly, I L Y. And likewise, you can construct L squared as well. I didn't bother to write down L squared, but it's in the notes if you want to see it. Um, before going on, let me make some remarks about this. Uh, although all three of the rectangular coordinates, x, y, and z, appear on these operators, when you transform over to spherical coordinates, you find that only the angles, they and phi, appear, but there's no radial derivatives. There is no DDR that appears. So the three angular momentum vectors don't involve any differentiation with respect to r. And the reason for that is, is that is that the angular momentum is the is the generator of rotations. It's the correction term for when you have a, an infinitesimal rotation, the correction away from the identity. And if you're applying a, a rotation to a vector, you don't change its length, you just move it. If it's an infinitesimal rotation, you just move it a small amount. If you apply one of these rotation operators to a function, the, you're going to be comparing the function at two points, which are which are at the same distance from the origin because it's just a small rotation. And since they're at the same distance from the origin, that's why you don't see any R derivatives. You're just you're just sensing the value of the function over a sphere. That's the meaning. That's the reason for this. Another thing to point out is the LZ operator is particularly simple. X and Y are fairly complicated, but this one's quite simple. And the reason for that is clear also. It's because the spherical coordinate system favors the z-axis. It's got this simple azimuthal angle about the z-axis, whereas the theta angle, is, there, there is no angle, there is no azimuthal angle on the x and the y-axis in the usual, usual coordinate system. So this one is particularly simple. All right. Now, let's go back to the equations we want to solve. Um, Turns out the way, it turns out that the, what, we, what we really want to do, again, if, if you go back to what we did with the, in the general theory, we spoke of finding the stretched eigenfunctions first and then applying lowering operators to get all the others. So allow me, if you let me do this, use my fingers here and replace this M by an L here. So we're getting, we're asking for the stretched eigenfunctions, psi L, L, and then and this gets replaced by L. So this, is, this would be the equations we need to, call, to solve for the stretched eigenfunctions. Actually, the L squared equation is harder to use and uh, because it's a higher order, second order derivatives. And it turns out that an equivalent thing to do is to replace, instead of using the L squared equation, is to use the fact that if you're in the stretch state, then the raising operator annihilates it. In fact, the stretch state is the only state that's annihilated by the raising operator. So we can replace this by L plus acting on the psi LL is equal to zero. 
that's more convenient for the L squared equation. Well, so let's solve these then. Let's start with the LZ equation. That's the easiest. So the LZ on the minus turns into minus, minus I H bar, which I'm throwing away now, setting H bar equals to 1, minus I D D phi applied to psi L L of R theta and phi is equal to the right hand side, which is L times psi L L of R theta and phi. So this equation is trivial to solve, and it is that psi L L of R theta and phi is equal to an arbitrary function of r and theta, because we have only phi derivatives here. We can call this f sub l l of r and theta multiplied times e to the i l phi. The LZ equation, in other words, gives us the phi dependence of the, of the i function. Now then, to that, then we need to apply l plus. Well, let's look at l plus here. l plus is minus i plus minus i phi plus minus i this, that, tangent theta, and so on. Let me, let me write it out. What we want to apply this to is our, our function psi LL. I'm trying to memorize this now. So, uh, I'm to cover it up. So this equation becomes minus i e to the i phi times, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's i, i d d theta, so it's, it's, yeah, it's i d plus i d d theta minus cotangent theta d d phi plus i d d theta uh, minus, uh, uh, minus uh, uh, cotangent theta d d phi applied to our solution here, which is f l l of r comma theta times e to the i l phi, and the whole thing is equal to zero. Okay, that's the l plus equation. Now you can cancel the constants out front because they they go, they go away. The e phi acts on the phi dependence here and brings down phi L. If you do this, then you can cancel the i's because it's a common factor of i. And then when you're done with that, you can cancel the e to the i phi because nothing depends on phi anymore. And what you get is an equation d e theta minus cotangent theta times f l l of, 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 of r of theta is equal to zero. And this is an elementary equation to solve, and it tells you that f l l of theta is equal to the sine of theta to the l power. And so the result then is for the stretched state psi l l of r theta phi is equal to is equal to sine l of theta times e to the i l phi. Finally, it can be multiplied by any function of r, and what is called g of r. You see, the LZ equation determines the phi dependence. The L plus equation determines the theta dependence, and that's all there is. There aren't any more equations. The r dependence is not determined. And the result of this is that this is an example in which we do need an extra index to resolve the genesis because L squared and LZ by themselves do not form a complete set. There's some other some other, some other uh, variable is needed. In fact, this g could re be replaced here by a basis of radial wave functions, call it un of r, and then we have that side, well, LLs, we're just looking at the stretch state so far. We have nll, and again, it's like this index gamma in the general notation. Okay, okay, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the basic solution of this. Uh, we'll carry on this uh, next time. This leads to the theory of the y elements. Thank you.